Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Zair Yuris and you know we've been having a lot of conversations about the IMF, the economy, debt crisis, blah 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 and as many of you've been listening to this podcast for a while um the most enjoyable conversations at least for me are ones with entrepreneurs and people you know in the startup ecosystem in Pakistan trying to innovate, trying to disrupt the economy and and that many of you have heard me say is perhaps the brightest spot in in an otherwise bleak economic or political economic outlook in the country so today we shift gears a bit um i am joined uh, by omar khan he's the founder and ceo of postex pakistan's largest e-commerce services provider they provide logistics and payment services as well um and omar you know his, his postex made a, a big headline some time ago late august uh, 2022 uh, when they made a big acquisition and then they've been growing rapidly uh, and 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 sort of figuring out the right way to grow in the pakistani market i think that's equally important as just growth um or more important than just growth so omar uh, welcome to pakistani i'm glad we could uh, finally do this conversation <laughs> thank you sir Thank you for having me. Um, I want to I want to begin by you know help us uh, and the audience understand a bit about Postex, what it does, and how did it go about uh, becoming the largest e-commerce services provider in the country. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll summarize the journey because it's a long journey. Uh, late, so mid twenty twenty. Uh, that's when we started working on Postex, the idea and the working around it, and then in mid twenty twenty one we launched. Basically, it was April twenty twenty one when we launched with the tech. The initial product was very simple and uh, straightforward that we will be doing the receivable factoring of cash on delivery orders and will be providing logistics. So from day one, it was a hybrid of logistics and for fintech, which is receivable factoring. Normally in Pakistan, uh, before we came uh, into existence or b- before we started providing services to e-commerce platforms, poorer companies were settling e-commerce platforms after 10 to 15 days. These were the normal standard uh, payment terms for them, and that was creating working capital issues for them, meaning that they would have to wait for the core companies to settle them before they could buy more inventory or they could invest on their own business. When that was their own capital, so they would sell their inventory, they would wait for the core company to sell them, and then when they sell them, then they would buy more inventory and start selling again. So there were a lot of pauses between their sales or buying the inventory and selling it out. It was hampering their growth. It was turning. If somebody was trying to grow faster than the capital they have or try to be more efficient, that would lead to their negative uh, working capital. Now, what we came up with a very simple and basic solution that, okay, the problem is around uh, working capital. So how do we solve that? Uh, and it is around cash on delivery, meaning that 97% of 95 to 97% transactions in Pakistan are being done on cash, uh, are being done on cash when we talk about e-commerce specifically. And meaning that for these businesses, 97% of their cash payments were delayed uh, by 10, 15 days. So we started doing the receivable factoring for these cash on delivery orders. But if we were just doing the receivable factoring, we would not have been solving the problem on both sides of the equation. We would have been just solving the problem for them, but then we would have been transferring that problem to us. And then our cash would have been stuck with the three PLs for uh, 10, 15 days. So we don't want to be in that situation where we have to run after three uh, PLs for our settlement. So we wanted to solve problem on the both sides. And the only way to do it was to solve inefficiencies on both sides of the equation. One side was they are getting working capital right away, meaning they're getting often payment specific amount, meaning depending on the risk profiling of their business, we would underwrite that business and we'll start giving them upfront payments uh, on day one, whenever we do the pickup. And on the other side, we do the logistics ourselves, meaning that we started with Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad initially. So basically it was Lahore and Islamabad when we started. And then we added Karachi after six to eight months. So for us, we were getting our cash back within 24 to 48 hours of the time when we were doing the pickups. Uh, meaning that we were not having that working capital issue of our own when we were trying to solve the same problem for e-commerce platforms. For at least... Uh, like I said, eight to 10 months, we were just operating in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, we, because that holds around 50 to 60% of e-commerce business in Pakistan for the uh, platforms who are selling or the platforms that are selling to the uh, consumers. The consumers are based in uh, in these cities, 50 to 60% of the sales, and the sellers are based in those cities as a majority of them, around 80% of them. 
Uh, we, we targeted on Karachi Lahore, Islamabad, and we realized that we were solving a really big problem for them because then we started seeing the influx. Uh, even though we were just offering three cities, there was a lot of influx of the clients. There was a lot. There were a lot of signups, and that's when uh, we we realized that we have to go go into fundraising if we want to keep scaling, if we want to keep growing. And we have been something that are very lucky uh, to be backed by one of the best, uh, not one of the, but like a few of the best investors in the world, not just in, in the region, in the world. And and the whole point of that fundraising was not to not to just get the money and then scale rapidly, was actually in play, was actually done, keeping in mind that we have to fuel this, the growth that we are seeing right now, the influx of the clients, the 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 signups that we are having right now. And we use those fundings to build the infrastructure. We use that funding to actually build better products, invest on the tech, invest on the team, because all that money was not just to spend on marketing or just to onboard clients, but was to build a better infrastructure, better fundamentals, uh, better unit of the product, and technically be more sound as a startup. Fast forward uh, 2022, uh, we scale, alhamdulillah, we started becoming, so we were having around 20, 25,000 transactions a day uh, within Karachi Lahore Islamabad, then it scaled to 30, and then uh, we decided to uh, partner, acquire Call Courier, uh, because when you see Call Courier as a legacy business, uh, and when you see Postex as a, a startup that is trying to solve a problem, you see a lot of similarities in these two businesses. They were uh, quick learners. They they came in, so they bootstrapped the business. They they knew the struggle. They they, they knew exactly the same struggle that we went through uh, to build a business initially for at least one year. Uh, we bootstrapped as well, and they have been boost. They had been bootstrapping for the last 15, 20 years. And then when you see somebody, uh, somebody like uh, Jawad Mirza leading a team, uh, and getting to a scale where they were at that time. It was remarkable. And then for me, it was like an opportunity to learn from somebody who has more experience, who has more knowledge, who has more understanding of the of the logistics industry. Because for us, it was it started as a, a product which we wanted to so as a product that wanted to solve the problem around working capital. And then logistics was as an embedded service that was going to help us scale our fintech and use as a hedge. But then when you start scaling, you realize that it's not that simple. It's not just about picking a product from one place and then delivering it to another point, to another place or from A to B. It is way more complicated and it needs uh, way more expertise. Um, and it's about scaling, right? And it's all also about scaling that to be operating not just in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, which are the metropolitan cities, but to cover around 500, 600 cities in Pakistan. And then when you talk about building that kind of infrastructure, it's not just about money. Uh, so the money is out of the equation then, because just because you have the money, you can't build the team. Uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of time to find the right people, putting them in the right place and giving them the uh, authority to run the teams in those cities independently so that we can scale in those cities. And that is the most difficult part when you're scaling a very operations heavy business. And then we realized that there is already a player which has done that remarkably, which has a brilliant team led by a brilliant CEO. So it's better for us to save that time. Uh, that's going to take us at least 15 to uh, one and a half to two years. It's not about the capital because uh, it's not that expensive to build those teams or that infrastructure, but it's really hard to build the uh, right teams and build the right kind of infrastructure in place. So it was a no brainer for us to. Uh, to work with them to make an offer and then they were and they saw our vision so for them it was not about money as well for them it was more about what we're trying to build where do we want to be in my next five years next 10 years because they were so even because they were a boot, that was a bootstrap business and it was a legacy business which was reinvesting their retain earnings their profits into the business you know what happens when you start doing that it just slows down your growth and somebody with capital is going to come in and start innovating, start building the uh, infrastructure, start building the tech, and then they will take the lead. So for them, the biggest challenge was that access to capital. And they, try, uh, they were trying to solve the same, similar kind of problems, but around logistics. But their limitations were around capital, not being able to invest properly on the tech or on different, uh, in different areas of logistics. So that's where we saw that, okay, this is the right kind of partnership for us. Because uh, I personally... It, don't look at it as an acquisition. I 
personally look at it as a as an opportunity to uh, expand the team to to have a team that is very much aligned on the same vision and you we are very lucky to have that in call career well that's fascinating in terms of how you explained this being a partnership right and and the need that you know capital can allow you to build that infrastructure it's not quote unquote rocket science to build it but operationalizing yeah. it is super complicated and we've seen that in pakistan you know with airlift going bust and the stories that came out right it's not that easy running a warehouse and running yeah. a logistics business is not easy especially in a country like pakistan i'll get to some of the challenges in just a minute um but uh, one question i had in terms of you know the cash on delivery model in pakistan and the way it, it sort of works um there is this view that you know the seller at least uh, the person you're giving the working capital to and underwriting it and then seeking efficiencies in your logistics side um is not worthy of credit right that's the whole idea of lazy banking that banks don't lend to these people and they struggle with working capital even when they get it it's really expensive um how have you found that experience working with particularly small businesses who are your customers and need access to capital and this idea in pakistan that hey these guys actually are not worthy of your effort because there's no money to be made and they're also risky customers i would love for you to sort of tell share your experience working with those people on the back end because there's a myth in pakistan that it's not a worthy market to go after <laughs> Uh, no that i would disagree this is the kind of same kind of questions i was getting when i was starting off uh, you know the idea came from sitting down with friends who wanted to start an e-commerce platform and then he kept complaining that i'm not going to be able to get uh, my money on time from the courier company so how would i run a business i would need a lot of capital to start it and then when i said okay what if somebody gives you upfront payments would that really solve a problem he said yes it will solve a problem for me but people will start running away with the money i'm like that's not how it works i mean maybe i'm i was working in, so i was working in the way at that time i was there for around 4 years and i'm like no i spent my whole life in pakistan and i know that's not that's not how people are in pakistan if we build the right product if we just start throwing money in the market then obviously uh it's high risk it's not just specific to pakistani market it's going to be it's, it's going to happen anywhere hey, we saw in ftx gonna... here in the united states yeah. a few months ago like you throw money at a entrepreneur who has a vision and you realize what happens a few months later yep so those challenges are there right but you uh, as somebody who wants to give them money or wants to help them access capital uh, need to hedge your risk first you need to have a product which is going to protect you first because uh, you're you're doing that for multiple businesses and if you are at risk capital that you're providing to each one of those merchants or uh, or sellers is at risk as well so you need to protect yourself by building the right kind of model hedging the hedging the risk and for us in this case uh, we looked at different uh, data points when we were integrated with them we were looking at their different data points their return ratio what kind of product they're selling who they're selling to demographically geographically and their uh, financial information as well the problem with the banks is that they have they have become very bureaucratic they they have certain criteria if you don't meet that criteria they're not going to be able to underwrite your business but that's where we come in we are flexible around that because we need we we see a business we uh and then we build those controls and then we build those uh yeah, ai models where we're going to be underwriting them it's the other way around for them they they have build those structures and then they try to put the business through it so if you make it through it then you're going to be able to get uh the loans or you'll be qualifying for a loan we saw these businesses as uh potential uh businesses that have high potential to grow we know e-commerce in pakistan is booming we know it's going to be growing in next 3 years 5 years uh 10 years inshallah so we saw okay how do we look at these businesses differently than a conventional uh financial institution to underwrite these businesses without having an exposure to the risk and for us it was because we are doing the logistics this is one of the other reasons why we decided to do logistics is that we will have the product in hand meaning that when we are giving them money up front we are getting the product in hand we are delivering the product within 24 to 48 hours and we are getting our cash back and then if it's a return it is automatically adjusted in their next payment this is a kind of service they're not able to get from anywhere else and just because of uh 5% returns then are going to be stopping the service or they're not going to be running away with that money because it's just a very 
and made an insignificant amount of money for them and for us as well. So it's a very low risk, uh, hedged with the product. So it's asset back receivable factoring in our case, where we control the inflow of the funds as well. Not control, like it goes through us. So we control, so we hedge our risk first and then we underwrite these things. And is the plan, uh, because you already are building those relationships with sellers and businesses that, you know, need working capital, but also would eventually as they grow, as you said, e-commerce is booming, uh, will need uh, additional capital just to grow their own business as well. Um, is your plan to move into other types of services that help them scale uh, as well? Or are you already doing that? Or or what's the strategy over there? Of course. Uh, of course, I'm glad that you asked. Uh, so the thing is that when you're solving their working capital issue, it's enough for them to run their operations efficiently, but it's not enough for them to grow their business, meaning that uh, they're competing with big players like Daraz, Kadi, Gulamad. And when you talk about somebody who's just starting a business or at a meet, uh, or doing 300, 400 transactions a day, they want to get to that level. And how do they get to that level? Because they're not going to be able to, they can't do that without having access to capital, uh, a lot of capital, right? So, and they, they can't go to the banks. There is no other source of uh, funding for them. The only way they can get the funding is from their friends and families. And that becomes very expensive because that's a profit sharing model. Uh, so we, we realized that, okay, there's another gap. Like solving one pro problem is yes, we are and we have Alhamdulillah solved that problem. Now, how do we help them grow the business? And that's where revenue-based financing comes in. And that's how we do the revenue-based revenue financing. That based on their last 30 days uh, orders or sales of last 30 or 60 or 40 days, we give them a certain percentage as a growth capital. And that is deducted from their daily cash on delivery payments. Certain percentage of their daily cash on delivery payments are deducted towards the repayment of the loan, principal, and the profit. So it's, we're building Shia compliance products, which are around revenue based financing for these e-commerce platforms, ranging from $5,000 to uh, $250,000. They can get instant uh, revenue-based financing ranging from $5,000 to $250,000, which is repaid within 30 to 60 days, depending on the payment terms. That's amazing. And I think that really solves a huge problem, right? In the sense that you, and I think the incentives are also aligned because your strategy is to have a more efficient logistics infrastructure, a more efficient capital structure in terms of your relationships with sellers. And as they grow, that risk of automatically comes down. The number of items they're selling yeah. goes up. That makes your infrastructure more efficient. Which brings me to my other question on the infrastructure side of things now. Um, obviously, as you said, um, it can be, you know, with capital, you can build all of it. But running it is a whole different story, particularly in a place like Pakistan, uh, which I, I would say, you know, even my work like covering India and Bangladesh and other emerging markets, not that different. It's very much it, the issues are the same, you know. Um, but I was curious to hear your thoughts about what have been some of the key challenges and learnings you've had as you've sort of scaled on the logistics side of things. Um, and and where are areas where you think, you know, what if certain barriers or certain issues were to be solved, um, your growth trajectory would actually significantly uh, be much more easier um, than what it is today. Um, so when we talk about the challenges, uh... So the major challenge is around educating different stakeholders. So when you're innovating, it's really hard for them to, uh, initially it's really hard for them to understand because they're, so let's just talk about my own my own team, right? They have been working. And so if you're talking about logistics, we have people from logistics who have been working in logistics for 10, 15 years. And then when you come in with a product, which is a hybrid of FinTech and logistics, for them, it's really uh, difficult or different to, uh, to to actually look at the product uh, and then understand it and then build operations according to that. So it's about, so when you're building a team and you have around 2,800 mashallah people working there, uh, it's really hard to educate everybody because everybody has to be on the same page. You can't have 200 people on a different, uh, going in a different direction, another 500 going in a different direction. So it's, when you have massive teams like this, it's about bringing everybody on the same page, having the same understanding, having the same vision. So this is, this has been this is basically my job to make sure that everybody's on the same page and they're working towards the same goal and why we're we doing what we're doing it's very important and because it's not just about picking the picking up the products from one place and delivering them because it's not just logistics anymore there's a purpose behind it and they need to understand the purpose behind why we're doing logistics now and that purpose is to actually help the businesses grow 
And if you're not, if we are not able to do our job uh, for logistics, we're not going to be able to help them with the financing as well. So it goes side by side, meaning that they need to understand how important their job is. It's not the legacy system where if you're doing the logistics, it's fine. If you're not doing the logistics, it's okay. You can get away with it. The, the things that we do, the the job that we do is putting food on the table. And we need to understand regardless of the size of the business, regardless of uh, who we are, the whose parcel that is, big, small, or MSME, we need to treat everything the same way. And because we're trying to help everybody the same way, we're trying to help them grow. We're trying, because if they grow, we grow. We're not gonna be able to grow on our own because we're not selling anything of our own, right? So it's very, so we have a lot of dependency on the on our partners who are working with us, who are trusting us with their products and we are trusting them with our capital. So it's a kind of relationship with them as well that uh, when you talk about educating the merchants, that it's not just about getting the money up front, it's about how you you should be using that capital to make your business more efficient, to run your day-to-day operations more efficient, which will generate more revenue for you, which will increase your growth. And when you get to a stage where you are eligible to get revenue, revenue-based financing, you how do you use that? Where are you seeing challenges? So it's each stakeholder who's part of the uh, ecosystem that we're building or that we have built, how do you educate that? How, how, do, you, how do you educate them? And that has been... Uh, one of the challenges that we have been facing, but uh, Alhamdulillah, we have been able to uh, have everybody on on the same page so far. Yeah, the other thing that you know struck me and and was curious to hear if you're seeing any trends that are worth pointing out here in terms of you know cash on delivery as a model, right? It obviously has inefficiencies in terms of the payment cycle, which is why you're in the logistics business to get more efficiency in in that system, which we've talked about. Um, but <clears throat> Obviously, if you were to have a shift towards less cash on delivery, more digital payments, then one would argue that not only is it far more seamless in terms of the payment and working capital needs, um, but also on the customer end, you can start building credit histories and give, you know, rather than a customer waiting for a you know, collecting 10,000 rupees to buy something they wanted to buy, you have a credit history and you can extend that credit to them. And again, that's a new revenue model, but also helps grow the market. Um, was curious to hear your thoughts on where is the sort of barrier to adoption of digital payments in Pakistan, or are you beginning to see that adoption already take off? Like, where does that stand? Because from my perspective, again, I'm, I, I approach this question a lot from the political economy angle, which is it helps formalization of flows and formalization of flows is always good for an economy to become more yeah. efficient, allows access to credit. You're on the flip side of that in the sense that it helps your business grow. And was curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, where does where do digital payments go in Pakistan and why are they not taking off the way that perhaps we've seen in the Indian market, for example? Uh, no, sir, we're not pro-cash, uh, just to be clear. Uh, we want digitization as much as anybody else. Uh, That's what I meant. Is- I meant that it, digitization helps you grow even faster, is, is my point. Yeah, of course. thing is, when we were starting off, uh, so the, the purpose of POSEX is to to bridge the gap between capital and e-commerce platforms, businesses, right? And when we were starting off, we realized that the biggest gap is in cash and delivery. So we can't really just ignore the biggest problem there is and then start working on digitization or start working on digital payments when we know three to 5% of transactions are cash and, uh, are, are digital payments. Would, would we really be solving a problem for a business if you're just solving their five solving the problems based on five percent of the transactions, five percent of their revenue? Not really, right? So we have to solve first we have to solve the biggest problem they have, which is cash on delivery, which is contributing 95 to 97 percent of their transactions, their revenue. That's why we started with cash on delivery and the model around it to hedge the risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now when we talk about digitization, it is going to take time. <clears throat> it is going to take time because, uh, you know, uh, the political unrest, you know, the economic situation, and these things do contribute towards slowing down the process of digitization. People, it's not just one side of the equation where we are expecting businesses to enable digital payments and then everything will be digitized, but it's the consumer as well. Consumer is not willing to make the payment. And it's not one factor is the economic situation and the political unrest. But the other situ- the other problem is that e-commerce is still very new in Pakistan. It's still growing. It's still booming. And there is 
still not enough trust between the consumer and the seller. And unless we have that, unless it's been normalized or unless they start having that trust on the on the seller, the consumers start trusting the sellers, you will not see that kind of digitization the way you have seen that in uh, developed countries because these things will take time. Time. Uh, the trust, building that trust takes time, like right? sometimes years, three years, five years, seven years, we don't know. We have seen how digitization was done in India. Uh, unless we see that kind of, uh, those kind of reforms happening in Pakistan, led by the government, not just one player is going to be enough to just digitize everything in Pakistan, turning cash into credit. And it's going to, and that means that the growth is, the conversion from cash and delivery to digital payments is going to be very slow because people are still very reluctant to pay by card uh, on a, on the payment gateway on, on the checkout page because they don't know if the products, because it's not just the seller as well, it's the three PLs who are part of that equation. Other than different uh, stakeholders involved, maybe the seller is selling the right product, sending the right product, but 3PL is not being able to deliver. And for some reason, they don't get the deliver. They got they don't get the product on time. So there are many factors that they're thinking. The consumer is thinking when they're placing an order: Am I going to get the product on time? Uh, if it's so if it's something that I need for uh, for a weekend, right? I'm, am I going to get it before weekend, or if they want to go to a wedding, or if they want to go to a party? Am I going to get the right product? Am I going to get the right color? Uh, is it going to be the right size, uh, or would I get the product at all or not? So these kind of factors are still going still in their mind when they're placing an order and. Until we take care of them, until they start trusting the seller more and the three PLs more, uh, we're not going to see that abrupt change in cash on delivery. But obviously, we are enabling our merchants to receive digital payments from the consumers. We are trying to shift towards uh, digital payments, but we still don't see that happening from the consumer's point of view. We still don't don't see merchants being very enthusiastic about receiving digital payments because they know that that's not really where they're getting the product, getting the sales. And then basically sometimes they lose sales on uh, digital payments. This is the feedback that I have been receiving from the merchants as well, that if their checkout page takes them directly to the digital payments, people just uh, don't perceive they it. Think, they think it's a scam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I was going to... It just breaks the flow of the yeah. transaction, meaning they're at cash on delivery, they want to press cash on delivery and they want to place an order and that's done, right? But for digital payments and they take them to another page, redirects them to another page. It's not like you're going to be putting the details on Shopify. And then it takes you to another page where you have to put in the details, then it places an order and then it goes back. So it's a different journey, slightly a different journey. And then that's where they start seeing the churn. They start seeing the consumers dropping. So they want cash on delivery as their default method of payment. So that unless merchant uh, unless the consumer is specifically looking for digital payments they're not taken to that page yeah and as it breaks the flow and adds friction to it um which is i was as you were explaining that i was like well that's where post x comes in to build that trust because if you're the sustained 3pl provider in this instance uh people trust post x saying the thing comes on time you're the ones picking up the product so you're reliable checking the quality all of that and i think that's the journey right in terms of building that trust with the customer who then is okay we're doing that in fact like you know i i was reading up on the a few months ago on the Flipkart journey. And that was, as you, as you were talking about, it's the whole ecosystem. That's what they had to do, right? Was they were a marketplace, yeah. build that trust. But then through that trust, they started EMIs on cell phones that helped digitize. At that same time, telecoms became cheaper because Geo was investing in 4G. That gave more uh, phones into the hands of more people, cheaper data. Um, that incentivized people to adopt digital payments. And oh, by the way, the government at the same time was scaling UPI which made it yeah. very easy and seamless to do the financing part and the payments part and build the payments rails, right? So you're, that's what you need. I, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times people that I talk to end up simplifying this too much. And I'm like, it's not as simple. You need a lot of alignment of incentives to make this journey work. And if there's yeah. friction in it or lack of trust, it's always, you know, especially with money, right? Like, you um, can break somebody's trust with, you know, something that is not good quality is cash on delivery, they return it. But if taken their cash up front uh, through a digital payment and then they have to go through the refund process, 
that person is going to be significantly unhappy than the person who yeah. rejects a cash on delivery, right? And I think that's it's a very valid point that people often... And the thing is, it's going to happen once and then they would not be using their debit card or credit card again for online payments. Correct. Not just with any merchant. So not just with that merchant, not, they're not going to be using that with any merchant because now they have lost uh, trust in that in that way of transacting, right? Uh, and then they just kind of take a step back and they're going to be like, okay, it's better to do cash on delivery because I'm going to have the product. I'm, I, I'll be, I'm going to have the cash anyway because they, everybody has cash on them. 3,000, that's the average ticket size, right? Ranging between 3,000 to 3,500. Everybody has that kind of cash on them. Uh, and they're more comfortable with that kind of uh, transaction where the product is at the doorstep, they pay, and then they, they get the product. Yeah, no, so yes, there are a lot of factors. It's not just that straightforward that you plug in, uh, checkout pay, digital payment, uh, digital payment on your checkout page, and then boom, everything is gonna change. You know, it's uh, it's a long process. Yeah, the one thing Omar, I've sort of in the feedback over this podcast, especially with when I talk to entrepreneurs like yourself, right? I get a lot of messages and questions from younger people, and I think it's a great change that at least I've noticed. I don't know about you was that in my generation, when you came out of college, you wanted to go to Engro and Standard Chartered or, you know, a nice multinational and then went a bank and work there. Um, the generation that now messages me is the 22-year-old coming out of college or whatever, is like, I want to work at a startup. I want to think about being an entrepreneur. I want to, you know, I'm inspired by uh, journeys like yourself, for example. And I was curious to hear your thoughts of like, what would you advise a young adult thinking about either working and thriving in a high growth, high paced uh, startup um, or thinking about their own idea and wanting to become an entrepreneur? What would you advise them about how should they think about and the skills that they should gain as they think about getting on that journey? So the two different questions. Uh, one is if you want to work for a startup and one is if you want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you see, it depends what you want. If you want a very secure job, if you want nine to five, uh, no headaches after 5 p.m., then corporate. Uh, you you would rather go to Engro, Nestle, any multinational or, or a bank, like a legacy business, any legacy business. But if you want to really make an impact, if you really want to change, if you really want to feel like you're involved and you're really building something which is going to change the life of people who you will be serving, that's where startups come in. But obviously, then there is no time, right? Uh, that's not a nine to six job. Uh, that is going to build you. That is going to train you to build things, to serve the market, to build a change. And that's like a uh, for you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, that's the best way to train yourself just to surround yourself with people who are super ambitious, who are who want to get things done, who don't care about the time, who don't care about uh, uh, their job description. They care about the purpose. They care about the real value they're bringing in, the, the, the real value, not just for that startup, but for the market that they're serving. And that's, if you have that kind of mindset, that's when you decide, then that's where you decide to work with uh, some founder who's already running a startup. And for if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think it's now uh, rather than waiting for two two years because if you start in two years, you're already two years behind. It's very simple. Um, I see a lot of people <clears throat> who are interested in being entrepreneurs, but they're just waiting for some reason. Uh, they they have different reasons. They, now it's the market. Before it was something else. And then before that, it was something else. If you want to start, if you're really sure about being an entrepreneur, if you really are sure about solving a problem, then you should start today rather than after one year or two years or three years, because then you are already behind uh, two years or three years. So why do you want to be behind? And because for, for us, we feel like, uh, so I started when I was uh, 30, right? And I feel like uh, there are businesses that are in business, legacy businesses who are, I have been in business for 40 years. So I feel like I was I was behind. I should have started it sooner. I, I would have been able to catch up with them. I would have been able to do a lot more if I had started two years ago. So why did I start uh, now? I mean, I should have started a long time ago. Because it's, you see, the first few years are going to be tough, are going to be super tough uh, in, your, in your journey. And you started today, you started two years from now, you started whenever you want, like in future, you're not going to be able to skip those two years. They always going to be there. It's inevitable. Just because you have the funding, you're going to have different challenges. It's a different kind of pressure. If you don't have the funding, it's a different kind of pressure. Pressure is always going to be there. 
And that pressure is going to help you build uh, a team, help you build a startup, help you, help you build a culture. And that culture is really important for you uh, to scale a startup. Because when you start scaling, when you are uh, not just a uh, few people sitting in the room, when you have a bigger team, culture is really important. Culture will really drive your startup to the next level. Yeah, so, I think that's a that's an underestimated point, and I'm glad you reiterate that the culture, um, you know, especially at scale, managing that, as you said, you have a few thousand people, keeping them all on the same page is your is your most important job at this point as well. Um, one question as a follow up to that, um, how do you think about failure and risk of failure as an entrepreneur? And I ask this question, I'll give you context because, you know, in our culture, society, broadly South Asian culture, East Asian culture. Um, failure is a taboo, uh, whereas in entrepreneurship, failure should be embraced. And I was curious about how you think about the risk of failure and interact with your team about failing and, and being okay with failing. We have been failing. Like if somebody says they have never failed in their life, they're wrong. They're mistaken, right? Uh, so why do we have a different approach for uh, for your, if you want to be an entrepreneur? Or why do we have to look at it in a different way when you're an entrepreneur? I have failed a lot of times. Uh, I have failed at doing a certain job. I have failed in my exams. I have failed uh, in exams. I have failed in uh, doing, uh, I have been fired from my jobs uh, for different reasons. But point being that it's okay to fail. I mean, what's a big deal about failing? I mean, for me, uh, obviously, I hate it. Uh, we're very competitive, and that is something that keeps me up at night. That I don't have room to fail. Uh, we can't fail, inshallah. So, but what can we do, right? We can give our hundred and ten percent. We can give our hundred and fifty percent, and then the rest is up to Allah. He's if he wants you to succeed, you're gonna succeed. But the only thing that that is in your hand, in your hands, is how much effort you put in. How much really? How much are you really working towards your goal? How much are you really working towards? Uh, how much? How honest are you to uh, to your work? Are you in your comfort zone and then you are asking everybody to do the work, or are you really willing to step out of your comfort zone first and then expect same from others, part of your team, right? Uh, or do you have like, are you being a hypocrite and then you don't want to do the work, but you just want everybody else to be doing your work? Uh, these kind of things that I personally think that really matter uh, is the mindset. Basically, it's the mindset, right? So I know that, okay, my job is to put in 200%, right? And then I can't control the results. Nobody can. So why do you want to worry about that? Why do you want to take decisions based on something that, that you can't control? You can control the input, but the results are out of your control. So let's just focus on what we can do. Let's just focus on what we have in our control, in our hands, which is the hard work that we can put in, which is the number of hours we can put in. And that's where we don't want, we don't, so I don't want to go to bed and feeling like I should have done more. I want to go to bed when I'm just, there's nothing with my you're, mind you're just passing out on your yeah. chair, not even yeah. go to bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, but yeah. that's the point, right? And then you don't feel, you, you're not going to regret uh, if the results that you're looking for, if you don't get the results that you're looking for. Uh, because you know you gave your 110% and you couldn't control the results. Yeah. And you can't control the results. Yeah. So no, it, it, that's that's yeah. such an important point in the sense like I've been watching um, uh, the test on Amazon Prime. It's about the Australian test team season two. I've been sort of catching up uh, on. And they have this really fascinating story in between about um, uh, Steve Smith. Um, and, and, you know, he talks about how for the first few years of his career, all he did was play cricket. He was, I had no time. But then he was like, as I got a bit older, a bit more mature, I realized I needed to find a way to do something else to keep my mind and in, in my mental health in a good place. Um, but he made the same thing. It was like when you're driven and when you're about to enter, build your career in sports or whatever field that might be, right? And this in his instance was cricket. You have to consistently show up, do the hard yards, and then you might just yeah. go out on the field and get out, but you got to stick to the process because the output, as you said, is not under your control. The input is, which is how do you train? How do you prepare for the game and all of yeah. that? And if you keep at it, uh, you will succeed because you're putting the input in and sometimes it might not go your way and that's okay. You move on. Yeah, no, precisely. Precisely. 
last question I had for you, uh, Omar, one, this has been a fascinating conversation. And I think um, it would be a shame if I didn't ask you this question, which because there is a whole lot of conversation around the broader economy going on, right? And you're an entrepreneur, you live, breathe, eat and live in that environment. Um, you know, we had in the startup ecosystem, amazing funding through the pandemic. Now, all over the world, it's been a down round or downturn. Um, Pakistan, obviously, the macro story is pretty bad. How do you see the environment in terms of the startup ecosystem in Pakistan? And where do you see it going, let's say, in the next 12, 18 months, given where we are, broadly speaking, in terms of the exogenous factors of the economy and the political economy in the country? Uh, so I'm going to answer that into two parts. Uh, one is that we have been very fortunate to get funded. And there are a lot of other startups that have re received a lot of funding in the last uh, 18 to 24 months. Now it's our turn to show the investors to the global markets that we have quality founders, we have quality teams, we have quality startups that can actually bring change and value with profitability within the next 12 to 18 months. That's where we that's where we come in. That's where we have to step up and show everybody that this nation can outperform anybody in the world, like any other uh, nation in the world, let it be our neighbors, let it be anybody uh, thousands of miles away, we have better quality of founders, we have better quality of startups, and we're solving bigger problems. So if we are able to step up, and inshallah, when we are able to step up, this market is going to start booming, booming again, which is going to be in uh, 12 to 18 months, depending on how the global, uh, like macro level uh, economy works out. The second part is that, you know, when, when you're getting the funding, it, there's a different mindset, right? So we, when we are receiving a funding or when we are raising funds, we are raising funds to build uh, a rocket ship. This is normally what we use that, okay, we're building a rocket ship, right? And then you're raising funds to build a rocket ship. And then all of a sudden there's a storm and you can't fly. But now you have to keep moving. So you have to turn that rocket ship into a car. And sometimes you're way ahead in building that rocket ship that it's really hard for you to go back and start changing and then keep moving because it depends on the stage of the startup where you're at. Because it's about it's not just as simple as changing gears and then it's just you just slow down and then you wait for the market to normalize and then you're gonna change the gears and then you're gonna start growing again. It it's it's the mindset of the team that you have you have told them to grow, you have told them to to build, you have told them to focus on, really focus on growth and start building the revenue streams. But all of a sudden you have to start focusing from the top line to the bottom line. And then you have to start changing their mindset. And then you have to start changing the mindset of the consumers that you're, uh, or the businesses that you're serving. So it's not as simple as just changing ourselves. It's about changing the mindset and the expectations of everybody who's part of it. And then you have to focus on your economics, you have to focus on everything else. So coming back to the example I was giving you that uh, some can do it right away. Some can do, some kind of take six months, eight months, 12 months, but there is no other option, right? Because if you try to, if you're not able to cope with the environment, you're going to be left behind. And it's even worse. And the worst than being left behind is not even to, not being able to make it uh, when things start normalizing. So we need to actually understand that, okay, uh, we need to go with the environment. We need to go with uh, the new changes. We need to understand, okay, that our targets are different now. And we have to make changes according to that. We have to make uh, changes to our mindset. We have to make changes to our business models. We have to make changes to our, uh, we have to set the expectations right for the team and for the market that we're targeting. That's, that doesn't happen overnight. That sometimes takes three months, six months, Nine months, but I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that every founder that has that is operating in this market is capable of doing that because we have really uh, amazing uh, founders in Pakistan. They're very very capable of doing that. Yeah, and I so inshallah we're gonna you. be fine. Yeah, I think we'll, it will be fine. And in a way, like you know, uh, it's the survival of the fittest too, right? So it also is great for the ecosystem in that sense that you have to change your mindset. You have to thrive in a different environment all of a sudden. Yeah. And if you survive in that and thrive in that, 
um, then not only domestically, but to, as you said, to global investors, to the global community, you prove the point that if you can thrive in an environment like Pakistan today, um, then just imagine what can you do when there's broader macroeconomic stability. And I think that to me is the most exciting part of where the startup ecosystem in Pakistan is. Yes, as an entrepreneur, it might be giving you nightmares, but to me as an analyst, it's amazing to see uh, companies like yours figure out a way to thrive in this environment because you know it's easy to be uh, really high growth uh, and, and sort of have high valuations when everybody's pouring money left, right, and center around the world. Um, you really find out who's capable of it. As I'll go back to the Stephen Smith example, if you can bat out in Sri Lanka on day five um, and score a century, then we kind of know you're a legend, right? It's it's the same. You're Babar Azam on a day five wicket. It's a different thing versus a day one Rahul Pindi track, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, in any case, Omar, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate uh, you taking out the time and sharing your insights with us and uh, look forward to uh, you know all your uh, success in the market. Um, and inshallah, see you in Karachi or Pakistan uh, next time I'm there. Uh, but in the meantime, keep thriving and, and keep at it. Thank you for having me there. Really appreciate it.